carbs are they needed for high intensity exercise? On one side, you've got dietitians saying carbs are one of the most important nutrients and that there's tons of research showing that eating carbs is good for sport performance. And on the other, you've got these folks out there on the internet who say, well, I eat a keto diet and that has next to no carbs and I'm performing just fine. Surely they can't both be right. <laughs> well, in the next few minutes, I'm going to walk right across the no man's land between these two diet camps and explain why both sides are in fact correct and these seemingly opposing worldviews of sports nutrition are actually entirely compatible. I'm making this video because loads of you have asked me to try and make sense of this conundrum. I'm kind of a rare species in that I'm a registered nutritionist but also one who's actively chosen to adopt carnivore and keto diets to fuel my training and performance. So what performances? Well, in the past, I've climbed E11 trad, V14 bouldering, 9A sport climbing and grade 12 mixed on a standard high carb diet. I did that for 20 years. I wouldn't do it that way again, but it did work and it is possible. But later, after years struggling against excess weight gain on this diet, I climbed those same grades on a ketogenic diet, eating next to no carbs. On the keto diet, I was able to push my standard to V15, and a couple of years ago, well into my mid-40s, eating a largely carnivore diet most of the time, I was able to climb V14 boulder, E11 trad, and grade 12 mixed within a year, which I'm not sure has actually been done before. So we've got medium length endurance, high intensity endurance, and explosive power disciplines, and I could train for all of them without any issues on a keto diet. Now you can tell me whether that counts as high standard sport performance or not, it just is what it is. But if you think that you need carbs to climb those grades, then I think my experience does present a challenge to the hypothesis, putting it gently. <laughs> so how did I do that? Well, let's start with the punchline of this video and then I'll work backwards from there. If you're a carb fueled athlete, and so you've geared your metabolic system towards reliance on that fuel, then you'd better eat some carbs. <laughs> you need to get your energy from somewhere and it's either going to be carbs, fat, or some mix of the two. If you deprive yourself of your main fuel, then things are going to go badly. <laughs> Dietitians correctly point out that there is lots of research showing that finding ways to increase carb intake for athletes during both training and performance yields improved outcomes. This is absolutely true. And they often express frustration that people don't seem to listen to them or trust their advice and stick to eating carbs. Where I think the nub of the problem is, is that dietitians don't always recognise that there's another context in which those research findings may not apply. That context is the keto adapted athlete. Keto adaptation is a thing and it takes time. And when I first switched to a keto diet, I was like every other carb fueled athlete who cuts carbs. I felt crap <laughs> and after a month I felt tired and sluggish and then I quit. Then the second time I did it, I did it properly, which means four specific things in practice. First, I made sure to cut carbs low enough for long enough to be in ketosis for many weeks. I also made some mistakes with electrolytes, which I then further tweaked and corrected. I also made sure to replace carbs with fat, like actual fatty fat. <laughs> And finally, I ate enough food. Like every other diet, there are ways for a keto diet to go awry. The main difficulty for many athletes on keto and carnivore diets is just eating enough. Lots of athletes have conditioned themselves for years to eat the minimum, and keto diets tend to lower appetite. That's why they're useful for people who need to lose excess fat. But athletes often omit to reset the weighting of their satiety signals when they try keto diets. You know, they still think that they need to walk around a little bit hungry all of the time to avoid weight gain, and that's not the case on keto diets. Alternatively, they might use the keto diet as a tool to actually facilitate underfueling, and unsurprisingly, that will backfire. <laughs> the keto diet isn't the problem in this case, it's the underfueling. But that didn't happen to me, because part of the reason that I tried a keto diet in the first place was because I was actually fed up feeling hungry all the time, and I loved being able to properly fill myself up with food all the time without needing to worry about the weight gain that caused me so many problems on the higher carb diet. Keto diets took that whole fueling and calorie problem or issue and just moved it out of the way for me. But back to the adaptation, it's normal for this big shift from carb fueling to fat fueling to take time. 
For many people, it will take a month just to feel normal again, and often a second month to really feel like you can train hard. And in some cases, it will take many more months to get those last few percentage points on the flat bit of the curve, you know, and get your very best performance from this diet. Most people are not motivated to do that. <laughs> the definition of an athlete, for me at least, is someone who's prepared to do what most people wouldn't do. So it's not that surprising to me that most people who try it wouldn't persist with it. A proportion of athletes won't get much benefit from a ketogenic diet over and above a high carb diet. And even those who will get benefit are going to need to get through an adaptation that might well make them worse in the short term. The studies that are often cited by dietitians to make a case for the unsuitability of keto diets in sport are often these ones lasting three weeks. They're too short. <laughs> How do I know that? Because the studies lasting one to three months have different results. I'm going to keep this video short, but I do need to quickly show you the results from a couple of them just to make this clear. So Philip Prins and colleagues studied competitive runners aged 30 to 50 with a VO2 max just shy of 60 and put them on a, either a high carb diet or a low carb ketogenic diet. After a month on the diet, they were put through a one mile time trial and a high intensity interval session of six 800 meter sprints with three minutes rest between each interval. So after that month of eating 40 grams of carbs per day, the low carb group were able to improve their one mile time the group on the high carb diet improved theirs as well, but by a much smaller margin. And it was a similar story in the repeated 800 meter sprints. The high carb or low carb diets made no difference to performance. And this follows on from another study by the same team using repeated sprints and a 5k time trial after six weeks of eating either a keto or, or high carb diet. That study also showed no difference in performance in the high intensity exercise. Both studies did however show huge shifts in fuel use at high intensities, which explains the results. In the athletes adapted to keto, the famous crossover point where as exercise intensity increases, fat oxidation falls away and carb burning increases, that occurred at a much higher intensity than has been reported in the sports science literature before. Different context, different rules. <laughs> but hang on a minute. If these athletes aren't eating carbs, where are the carbs coming from that they're burning? Surely their glycogen stores must be much lower. Well, we have one important study on this, which has been around for eight years now. I'd love to see it replicated because some sports scientists have expressed some disbelief that it can be true. Athletes well habituated to a low carb diet had similar resting glycogen levels to the comparator group of athletes on a high carb diet. And moreover, after a bout of glycogen depleting running, they were able to restore muscle glycogen at a similar rate to those high carb athletes, despite the fact that their post exercise meal was high in fat and very low in carbs. What this points to is likely efficient recycling of glucose in the body, which I explore in much more detail in my long video on this subject. Eating carbs and storing glycogen are not the same thing and they shouldn't be equated, again in the context of those adapted to a low carb diet. One caveat though, the studies I just mentioned are in fairly well trained athletes but not world class elite athletes in Olympic distances. If we had that data using elite athletes plus a proper duration of adaptation, that would be nice, that would be lovely, but we don't have that. An absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. It's just not an evidence-based statement to say that high carb diets are the only option for high level and high intensity sport. To be totally clear, I think that even for high level athletes on keto diets for large parts of the year, Judicious use of carbs during competition or during periods of very high energy expenditure may still be beneficial. If we use them sparingly, we can actually get the benefits of low carb diets in those who need them, but still have the convenience of carbs in specific situations. We are allowed to use both low carb diets and carbs where appropriate, just as we select from different training methods. I won't expand on that here since this video has a very narrow focus, which is just to emphasize that high intensity training can be done on low carb diets. And so that leads us on to one more really important question that folk often ask. If very low carb diets had any utility in sport performance, how come we don't see more elite athletes actually using them? Surely if the best don't use these diets, then we shouldn't either. Now that's an excellent question and it's a question that exposes the limitations of a kind of simplistic way of thinking about performance nutrition. 
you know, if it works for the elite, we should just copy it. <laughs> but I don't think we necessarily should. Elite athletes are a self-selected bunch. They can respond well to training and they can achieve a good body composition while eating lots of carbs, for a while at least. <laughs> they don't use keto diets because they don't need to, broadly. Moreover, they don't use them because much of professional sports nutrition advises them not to. <laughs> so it's not that surprising that not many athletes do. On the surface, the argument made by dietitians that carbohydrates oxidised at high intensities and that research shows that eating more of it is good for performance, it kind of seems like a slam dunk argument. So I wouldn't really expect athletes to question this and think, well, is there another context? Would there be an advantage of doing it a different way? But what about the rest of us who don't feel good or struggle to perform well eating high carb diets? perhaps struggling with an energy roller coaster or with hunger or with excess fat gain. Should we just try harder to make high carb diets work? Well, I don't think that's necessary. The data that we have shows that with proper adaptation, we can train and perform at high intensities on low carb diets and glycogen storage can be managed quite well so long as athletes eat enough food. If you take a group of athletes and you average their data, there's no advantage or detriment to either a keto or high carb diet. It's a wash. But for you, the individual, it might be a different story. You might perform slightly better on one or the other. Unfortunately, I can't predict which. You probably just have to try it, I'm afraid. I've been very lean and performed very well on high carb and low carb diets, but the low carb diet is preferable for me because I get a more steady energy supply, less hunger, lower body fat percentage, I can eat more food, I can have better mental health and better skin health, and ultimately that's led to better performance for me. I was fed up not being able to train for four hours without being hungry and having energy dips and being totally reliant on snacking right in the middle of my training. I spent 20 years trying to eat like elite athletes, but eventually realised that the keto diet made it easier to achieve the results I was looking for. So, conclusion. If you're habituated to eating carbs, then yes, you need to eat carbs to perform well. Alternatively, if you've got a reason to go through the adaptation to a keto or carnivore diet, which takes time, it has been shown that it is possible to train and perform just as hard without eating much carbs. This episode is really brief and it's focused on a very narrow question, but possibly it will leave you with more questions such as how are the glycogen stores replenished on low carb diets? How do I know if the diet might be an option worth considering and is it even healthy? If that's the case, then you might enjoy the very detailed episode I already made referencing 150 studies and going deep into all of those questions. Right, I suppose I better eat this croissant then. <laughs> Carbs are not evil, they're not the devil, they will not do me much harm. If I make a habit of it, then it may not be optimal, it's just not my choice to eat this way habitually. Back to the steak and eggs. See you in the next episode. <laughs>